So welcome back to episode two, season three, the Pause of That podcast. Uh, hopefully this will be the most impactful episode. I expect a lot of humor, but I expect everybody to have their notebook out. Um, really take in what you're about to hear. I'm going to humble myself, and I know Rich obviously is one of the most humble people I know. So Rich, welcome to the Pause of That episode two, season three. Well, Jeff, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. This is quite the setup you have here in uh, Midtown Manhattan. You know, it took me 10 months to actually have the balls to invite you because I had to kidnap you at the schedule with your time and actually get you in Manhattan. I know I kind of hinted at it a couple of times, but I finally sacked up and, and you know, got you in here. There was an old uh, movie by, with Kurt Russell when it called Escape from New York. I had Escape from New York back in 2002. <laughs> so, yeah, I need to be back. I turned to a pumpkin. Well, it's so. glad to have you back in here. You know, I'm always in your house, your environment. So now I wanted to bring you into my world. Um, so let's get to it. So, you know, last June, obviously... COVID hit all of us by storm. We thought it was going to be maybe for a couple of weeks, a month. And then here we are in early June. I'm you know, running on the streets of Jersey City, trying to do push-ups with my son on my back. And I'm like, this isn't working for me anymore. So I sent you a text and said, hey, Rich, um, you mind training me? What was your thought process when I hit you with that in the middle of June after not hearing from me for a while? Well, again, my mindset then was a little bit different than it normally would be. You know, at that point, uh, kind of a little bit of a survival mode had been shut down for a solid uh, month and a half. So at that point, I was, uh, hey, I was looking for any type of business I can get, to be perfectly honest with you. So I, it, was a welcomed, it was a welcome text, maybe a different, time of, uh, a different time of my life or a different time in the business's uh, trajectory. It wouldn't have been. So for those of you that don't know, Rich owns two facilities combined in one, a high-performance athletic training facility, Parisi Speed School in Fairlawn, and also the newly at the time opened Escape Fitness. Do you want to dive into like the facility, how big it is, the history of it, um, and kind of give people a vision of this massive you know, conglomerate you've built so they get an idea of what COVID actually did to impact you? Yeah, so the facility is, uh, is very unique. It's a high performance uh, training center. Uh, the total facility is 32,000 square feet. Uh, we have a 5,000 uh, square foot turf section uh, 5,000 square foot gym section for uh, performance training. And to me, the, uh, the marquee uh, part of the uh, facility is a six lane, um, uh, 20 millimeter Mondo track, six lane that's 60 yards, that has actually a long jump pit that we can uncover. We do long jump competitions, triple jump competitions there. Then the other side of the facility is a, uh, a brand new, newly branded new equipment, Escape Fitness Now. Escape, Escape Fitness actually is, it just wearing the shirt proudly, thank you. <laughs> you were in the other one too, kind of like, we didn't just, plan this. Yeah, it just kind of yeah, worked out. <laughs> yeah, I kind of had a figure you'd be wearing that We're two shirt, walking so. billboards. <laughs> so uh, Escape, Escape Fitness, for those, probably no one really does know who's listening to this, because very few people do know this information. They're a very large, high-end equipment maker. They make these uh, really, really uh, top-end rigs for training, physical training. They're based out of uh, the UK. I was looking for a name for that part of the uh, building. Uh, the opportunity came to be their first gym in the United States. So I've got the first Escape Fitness Now gym. And that part of the facility, you really got to come see it if you can, if you're in the Fairlawn, New Jersey area. We're about 10 miles outside of uh, the location we sit now here in Manhattan. You have a uh, three-pod room with a rack and um, it's like weights. You have an octagon room that's got this really cool like rig in it. You have an open gym. You have a big group X room. So it's really kind of like five gyms in one. So that's the new part of the facility. The performance side has been there. We're coming up on uh, 23 years. We've trained countless, countless like you know, professional athletes, all the sports, Olympic gold medal winners. Um, really had the first NFL uh, team-based tri- uh, training combine program. Also was really the first gym that trained UFC fighters, believe it or not. George is big for UFC. Yeah, Martin Rooney, uh, he got involved with the Gracie family, like the first family of the UFC, of uh, jiu-jitsu fame. He was training a lot of the fighters early on, like the Frankie Edgars, uh, Jim Millers. And they've all trained that, that Ricardo, facility. Ricardo, a, a, a bunch of Gracies, so, you know, too numerous to, to list. But the, tr- the, the facility itself on the performance side has a long, rich history. Now, because we obviously bring multiple facets to the podcast, it's not just about you or what you've done in life. It's about business. It's about startup. It's about mentality. So correct me if I'm wrong, you just opened up Escape Fitness before COVID hit. 
Yeah, our timing wasn't, was, wasn't the best, to say the least. So we actually had our grand opening at the end of October. So basically we were open for like, we'll say better half of four months, maybe mm-hmm. five months, and then COVID hit, we had to completely shut down. So now obviously you shut down memberships, faucet somebody turns it off. What's going through your mind at that point in time? Being who you are, as strong as you are, at the age you are, seasoned, a true professional and expert, what's going through your mind as a business owner I just opened up this business, dumped a lot of money into it, and now I can't even earn. Well, that's interesting because looking back now, if I knew what I know today, I would have been scared. Because really, if people remember back, I would be closed for two weeks. I think it was two weeks at first. Yeah. We're good good in April. Okay, uh, you know, from uh, it was March 18th. We'll be closed for the rest of March. By mid-April, we'll be back. This is going to, you know, we're going to flatten the curve. That was the talk, flatten the curve, flatten the curve. So you're going to be closed for maybe uh, 30 days, you know, so 15 days, maybe 30 max. So I was like, okay, you know what? Yeah, I could stand that. I got, a, I got a pretty big cushion here. I'm a guy that needs to have a cushion, allows me to sleep at night. So, okay, so we're going to be closed for maybe a month tops. If I knew what was going to happen, that we'd be closed for well over a year. Boy, I don't know, I don't know what my mindset would have been. But at that time, I was like, okay, we'll weather this storm. It's only be a couple of weeks. Let's talk about how everyone, as you grow up and get more involved in business and make more money, I use the term, you become complacent or fat. Fat could be either physically fat or mentally fat, right? Um, We usually, as business owners, look, you know, get in the grind, get in the trenches, and then slowly work our way up, where now we're just overseeing everything. Talk about how COVID got you back into doing what you absolutely love to do, which is training people one-on-one. Yeah, so what happens, you know, you, you try not to be complacent, obviously, because it's, you know, it's, it's the workshop of the devil. And what happens, though, is the money's flowing in. We're very profitable. We got this big, you know, marquee franchise, professional athletes, general population. Everything's great. Boy, you, you, you hate to say it, it kind of took my foot off the gas. And I was really surprised that I let myself do that. But then when you're shut down for all these months and you're sitting in a, in, in, in a room with no heat on, you can, see the, you can see your breath as you're thinking, boy, you really start peeling back the onion. Especially 30,000 square feet. 30,000 square feet. The bills are coming. You know, I'll, I'll say this. I was very thankful. My landlord you know, gave me uh, – I'm in the process now of paying him back the back rent or paying the, the corporation back the back rent for the 32,000 square foot facility. But at the time, he called me and said, I yeah, understand you're shut down. Don't worry about it. You know, when time is right, we'll start making some, uh, you know, some paybacks to what's going to be owed. But don't worry about the rent right now. But the PSC and G bill comes, the garbage pickup bill comes, tax bill. I, that does not stop coming, and no money is coming in. And you really start to say, okay, this money, that money, this hour, that hour, and you really, really take it all the way back down to, okay, this is how much we're spending to the to the to the penny. And this is how much is coming in to the penny. Okay, if I did this or I do that, you start making all these moves to try to position yourself to build back the cushion you once had. Let's talk about our make or break moment, which will probably sit in the front of my mind for the rest of my life. Um, I don't know if you weigh as much important to it as I do, but I do from, I'm going to say a growth standpoint, right? So backtrack, if it was 2000, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way up to maybe even 2019. Um, if somebody had put me in place, and even though I was wrong, I probably wouldn't have admitted that I was ever wrong, and I probably would have never shown up again. So I showed up to one of our training sessions, and we train early. Um, I showed up at, I think it was like 7.03 or 7.04, and our, our session starts at 7. Um, walk us through. Walk me through, walk everyone through that moment when I had shown up late um, and how I responded from that and how I kind of feel like that solidified our relationship even more so from how I responded to that by not telling you to basically go after yourself. And I actually accepted responsibility for being late. Also, how you demand people to show up on time because that's how you you know, conduct your entire life. Show yeah, up on time. I, it's something that I don't sit and strategically think about. I take it so personally that I express exactly how I feel. And one thing that I don't tolerate is lateness. I think it's, you know, I don't think it's, 
don't think it's good for anyone. It's not good for the person who's late, and it's certainly not good for the person who's waiting for them because you're really not being considerate of that person's feelings or that person's time mm. or your own time. Think about it. You know, the, the old axiom that um, our greatest commodity is time. So once it's gone, you can't have it back. It, it, it is true. So to me, if you don't respect yourself, respect your time, how are you going to respect my time? So one thing that I make it perfectly clear to everyone, I always draw the line very thick in the sand. You will be on time. If you don't want to be on time, if you're not going to respect my time or be conscientious of my time, you will not train with me. And Jeff, when I say this, I've had this conversation with some, you know, you know, some people that really aren't used to being talked to that way. I think anybody in that position, I use this as an example. And I say that because that was a humbling moment for myself. I'll never forget this. I did leave early, right? I got stuck behind somebody on a back road, which took normally takes six minutes, turned into like 16 minutes, right? But it was like, I remember coming out every excuse. Oh, I was drunk behind this. I was stuck behind this. I left early. Oh, I'm 19 miles away. I'm coming from Jersey City. And at the end of the day, it was all just bullshit excuses, right? So what did I do to change that? Now I show up 30 minutes early. Like I get up an extra 40 minutes earlier. So I get up at 525. I'm out of my house by 540 the latest, and I'm inside your facility at 630, even though we don't start till 7. And I did that from a pride standpoint. Like, I don't want to ever be late again. And I can't. The one time, remember, I blew out a tire. I pulled the car over on the side of the road, and I Ubered to your facility because, like, that was such a powerful moment. And, again, like, you look at a coach or somebody, a teacher or an employer or whoever in the past, right? If they would have said that, I would have been like, screw you like i'm paying you you know you're i'm your client but in this moment i don't want to say it was a come to terms of being like call it like a boy to a man because i'm past that like boy to man phase right but that was a real man to man moment where my level of respect even though it was high for you i consider i've always respected you since the day i met you since the day you told me i was going to run a five flat 40 and i did i respected you from that moment that made me respect you even more because you were right does that make sense? Absolutely. And there's a couple of things here. The first thing I'll, I always tell people, and I've, I've said this numerous times, I'd rather be 20 minutes early a thousand times than late once. You know, I'm mortified to be late. Now, is it pride? Is it some type of, like, you know, just a personality trait? But, um, I, again, I take it very, very seriously. Now, I'll say this. My method of getting that message across to a person like yourself in that situation probably needs to be maybe honed down a little bit because, Jeff, you came back. Next day. Other people don't occasionally. Right. Now, is it, do they say, well, F. Rich, who does he think he's talking to? Probably. And Or is it, you know what, I can't commit to being on time. That's just not realistic. Do you think it's I can't commit to being on time or I can't commit to hitting this level of achievement or greatness and be accountable to this person for this extended it's, period it, of time? It's, it's the accountability factor. That's what it is. Yeah. I, you know, I, I'm, whatever it is, I'm a business owner, or I'm, a, I'm a professional athlete, whatever it might be. And I know in the NFL, if you're late, it's a $5,000 fine. So guess what? Guys aren't late. I can't find you 5000 so it takes different things. It takes 40 sessions out of my pocket. Yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> to take me being a little bit of a, let's say, being a little hard about it to get the message across. I, I, you know, I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to say, I need you to be on time. It's not negotiable. And potentially lose your business as opposed to me just like holding my tongue, biting my lip as you're, I'm waiting at 7.05, 7.10, and the, and the person comes strolling in like with a cup of coffee in their hand, and it's like, no big deal. What have you found to be the most valuable lesson that you've taken over the past, call it, six to nine months? So once COVID kind of like shake out a little bit, now people are getting back out of the summer last year, what have you taken from this whole business restructuring standpoint yourself, personally? Don't, you, don't ever get complacent. You know, you always got to keep your foot on the gas. It shouldn't take a, uh, a pandemic, complete shutdown, to really, really, you know, look at every single penny. I know it could be maddening at times, but, you know, I do, I do like Excel. You and me both. That's one of my favorite things. Yeah. 
So, you know, again, that needs to be done. You know, you, you definitely need to manage a business by being there, even no matter how many competent people you have. You know, I think the people that work with you, work for you, whatever the term you want to use is, are relying on you to basically manage those pennies. And I, I really don't have a problem in that. And that's, again, I miss that. You know, to really, you know, I have an extensive background at UPS. Hey, let's get into that real quick, actually. So your background was actually UPS. And then at a certain time frame in life, you said, I'm going into this sports performance training world. Not really. There wasn't a, it wasn't a snap of a finger. That's no, sure. it wasn't overnight? No, it didn't happen overnight. By any Walk means. us through that evolution. Okay, so I took my daughter into the Parisi Speed School on my wife's uh, uh, request. She was a, a relatively competitive softball player, my daughter, Samantha. And she likes to train. She likes to train to this day. So I brought her in. So wow, this place is great. I was. A, how old was she at this point? She how was, old? Uh, it was two thousand and seven. Okay. At the time, I was. I still am a highly competitive, believe it or not, deadlifter. It's like the thing I do from a physical, from a physical activity is what I do the best. What's the most you've ever done? A uh, six ninety four pounds. Pound six ninety four pounds. And I walked into this facility. It's like wow, this is an amazing place. And again, it was, it, was a, it was a, I think it was a crunch. It wasn't a crunch den. It might have been a, uh, an intox or some, some other name on one side and the Parisi's on the other. So I didn't even Parisi, Parisi. But it was an adult health club on one side, performance on the other. I said to the, uh, the program director, not only will I, I'll sign my daughter up, but I would like to train here, but I, I need to train on the Parisi side. It's like, why? Because I'm getting ready for a competition. At the, at the competition, I pulled 683. I'm getting ready for a competition. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, at the time, I believe it or not, I had a YouTube account, believe it or not. This was... Uh, in 07. Yeah. Were you the I, first subscriber on YouTube? I think it might have been. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> me, and, uh, <laughs> me and Moses. And uh, I had a channel since 2006, actually. Wow. So I showed him the video. And he's like, he was uh, mildly impressed, I guess. He's like, let me train on that that's side. Yes, yeah, so I'm training on that side, training on that side. And that's where I met Martin Rooney, who was a kind of like the godfather. One of the, one of the true, like, Mount Rushmore characters of performance training. Which back then really was still kind of yeah, it was kind of like life. Martin Rooney, uh, Mike Boyle, um, maybe Vestigian. I'm trying to think of some of the other players who were kind of like him. You know, still Shaw. unknown, though, right? Yeah, definitely. That like performance training was just kind of like you know, wasn't really done at this level for, for by, any, by any stretch of the imagination. So through that relationship, you know, me talking about lifting, I end up getting like a part time job. Uh, working at the NFL Combine, as I still was working at UPS. And you weren't just like a regular guy at UPS. You had worked your way up to high level. Uh, yeah, I was a man, I, yeah, I was a man, I was a managerial uh, position. I was running a, a, some like a pretty some pretty big headcount operations. And that was how many hours per day during the week? A lot, yeah, yeah. a lot of hours. So you would work, <laughs> let's say, 10, 12, 14, 15 hours at UPS, and then go right over to yeah. Pre- so I was at Elmsford. I was running an overnight at Elmsford. So I show up at Elmsford like one thirty in the morning, and work there to say like twelve, twelve thirty. And then uh, go to Parisi and do like you know train Chris Long <laughs> you know, on the bench press, you know for the for the combine. So from UPS right to the NFL combine potential work. Right, and it was it was interesting. So that was two thousand seven, I believe, or I think it was two thousand seven or eight. And that year, we had this, had this uh, big combine group, and at that, at that point, I was a, I was a big time. You know, I was a I was a power lifter. I liked like that part of it. I, I enjoy as a sports fan. It's like, wow, this is pretty cool. I got like you know, Chris Long, uh, Ray Rice. Uh, Trump Simpson, some of these other guys who, big athletes, big yeah. Like, so like that year for that for the draft, uh, I think like fourteen or fifteen guys got drafted that I was kind of working Huge. with. Yeah, it was exciting. So I did it the next year again. So I, so you know, and I was doing so my. So at lifting. this point, do you think this is going to turn into a potential career? Or are no. you sitting here like this is kind of fun? Yeah, this yeah. is great. You gotta remember <laughs> at this point, I was at UPS for over twenty five years. Right. So you're locked in. You're already thinking. I'm like, okay, I'm 25. I, uh, 25 years in. I got to get to 55. I'm a two unit guy. I'm on the Elmsford preload right now. What's my next assignment going to be? Bah, 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 bah. You know, I was on 43rd Street, Masbeth. I was kind of moving around a little bit every two years or so. So I'm like, okay, I got to get to 55 here. And it started like, it's like, wow, there's, hey, can you help us with this? Can you do that? I was at the Precy Speed School sure, now. Sure. It's like, you know, I was like, wow, you know what? I think I could do something here. So, so you had that, like, aha. Uh-huh moment yeah it was to a point where yeah i kind of saw the opportunity i was 45 at the time yeah 45 or 44 at the time i got to go to 55 at ups get full boat but ups when i started ups as a privately held company going through the management ranks i accrued a lot of privately held stock stock goes public in 1999 i did okay in that move to the point where i can 
Maneuver. Figure, you man, you maneuver, I say figure things out. Yeah, yeah. So I kind of figure things out from there. So now you and I both know that that private UPS stock is now embedded inside of your facility. So I know we'll be training. You'll be like, yeah, that was the bonus from 1998, right? So now yeah. you have hundreds of, you probably have millions of dollars of equipment now. At this point, I would right? say one thing that Maybe I take a lot million? of pride in is, um, is the facility and the equipment. You know, I have you know twenty five thousand dollars treadmills by me, high speed treadmills. Multiple. Yeah, two of those, uh, isokinetic systems, uh, you know, three power plates. So do you kind of feel like it's a museum for the high performance athlete? It's almost like a showroom. Showroom. Not, like not a showcase, museum. Showroom. Yeah, museum would make it sound like it's old. This right. is the cutting Brand edge. New, Dude, this is the cutting. Yeah, this is like. Hey, you want to get on an isokinetic runner? What's that? Well, it's a brand new technology. You want to go on the high speed treadmills? What's that? Hey, it's the newest technology. You got pro uh, uh, power plate pro fives, newest technology. Did you ever find yourself, obviously being UPS is corporate, like you're checking in, you're checking out. I wasn't out. corporate because I was I was in the operation. I wasn't corporate. So it wasn't corporate. No, 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 no. Corporates in Atlanta. It was, you know, there was, that, that's different. This is. I was a, a manager of the operation. So do you feel that it was more, obviously it was structured. Did you know at an early age or early on that you were fit for being an entrepreneur or a business owner? No. But do you then feel that UPS essentially trained you and groomed you to be that? I was fortunate because some of the assignments I had at UPS, you know, UPS is a, it's a, it's a very interesting company. Back when I started with it, everybody was basically promoted from within. So I was a person. And UPS is very much like the military. It's different grades. So when I left, I was, uh, I think, grade 17. I started as a grade one. <laughs> How high can you go? I th Don't quote right me. Time. I, I, think, I think they consider 26, maybe. Oh, so you still had a ways to go. A CEO. Oh. I was going to be the CEO of UPS. <laughs> maybe. Like, so uh, the division manager is 18. District is 20. Maybe 24. I, did you really don't talk grade. We, we, like, the CEO of UPS doesn't have a grade. Gotcha. But like a, a supervisor is a grade 10, 12, manager 13, 14, Understood. so forth and so on. So as, as I'm working my way through the ranks, I, I, I had different assignments. One of them, I was a quality control manager. So the quality control at UPS is guided by the balanced scorecard. So there's this whole balanced scorecard that was created by the Harvard Business School. I got educated on that. And UPS, they made sure that they gave you the proper education when it came to these different job assignments. You know, so I was very fortunate because, again, you know, I managed drivers. I managed inside operations. I was technology manager. I was quality manager. So I had all these different assignments where UPS basically would make sure, made sure that I was fully educated on these different principles, the highest level principles. Like I'm an expert on the balance, oh, I was, I shouldn't say I am, I was an expert on the balance scorecard. So now you take those four categories you just mentioned, obviously being a business owner, you essentially have to have those skill sets or you should have those skill sets in order to succeed in what you do now. So how have you seen that translate to being a business owner and what you do? Because obviously you, you own and manage a gym and you own and manage your facility with speed, but you have employees, right? You have a front desk person, you have your coaches, you have clients. So bringing that all together in one, do you think you would have succeeded or are succeeding the way you are without that UPS background no, or no? Because I use UPS. My big thing is mentally is I want to create a UPS in this world, which is kind of unheard of. So I, I, I provide benefits. I have a phone plan. I was on the brink of um, having a 401k plan before the COVID hit. But again, that's back on that eventually gets way back on the table once I solidify sure. uh, solidify the business. But I, I try to run the business I own right now the way UPS was run. You know, it's you synthesize, you synthesize people and you find people who basically feel as if the business was is or, or uh, is theirs. Now UPS, we should refer to each other as partners. Like who owns UPS? We always say we owned UPS. That was before we were, you know, sure. uh, public. Sure. But even when we were a publicly held company, we always considered ourselves to be the owners of the business. Obviously, it's a fifty, sixty billion dollar business, sure. whatever it is. You own your piece of it, right? You know, with with my business, the, the my coaches, most of them, been around a while, with with us. I want to make sure that you know, again, it's very much like UPS. You know, I want to create for them an environment that they can have a career. You know, work their 20, 25, retire from there and have something like a pension. That's my goal. 
So I, I take a lot of the principles from UPS and I apply them to this business, which is, if you look at it, they're both services. Sure. And there, there's just so many crossovers between the two, believe it or not, because a service is a service. At the end of the day, service is service, and people are people. It doesn't matter what you're providing right. or what it is. If it's McDonald's, if it's UPS, or if it's Parisi Speed School Escape Fitness now, we're services. So for all the parents listening, obviously, again, you've trained the top of the top, right? Sent guys to the league, helped guys, I'm assuming, get back into the league and get workouts and everything, get their body where they need to be. What's your advice for parents that they think their kid is going to be the next first-round draft pick or they think their kid is going to run that 4 3 40 from a 5 or a 4 9 40. What's your advice to them? What, what do you want parents to know before they come to your facility? they got to be realistic. You know, it's the bottom line. Is every kid going to run a 4 or 4 if they come to preseason? No. You know, they have to be realistic. And, and again, we're fortunate. I think most parents that do come here who are looking for that type of training, mm -hmm. we, we, have, we have a lot of youth athletes in, in, our, in our facility. You know, some are just there just to get, you know, get working. That's kind of your sweet spot. I feel like the youth athlete, yeah. correct? Yeah, youth athlete. And they're, um, they're some that, you know, again, they're just coming to get a workout in. You know, they're doing the, the membership classes. They're just learning speed techniques, learning the, uh, the mechanisms of running, just, just getting a workout and learning how to lift weights. And then you have the ones who work on one-on-one. -on -one. You know, we do have quite a few scholarship athletes, quite a few college athletes, high-level high school athletes. So really, you know, not, not everybody's going to the league. Obviously, we know that. Not everybody's playing in college. Hey, my goal is this. I want to be. I want to make the high school team. You know, I want to be the best high school player I could be. I want to be the best at this. Or guess what? I just want to be at, you know, um, active. I want, I want to learn how to lift weights. I want to learn how to run right. I do hear that a lot from parents. You know what? A kid runs funny. It's like, probably very common, right? Because, again, you need to be trained to run properly. Because if you let yourself just run, the body is not going to run with, with proper mechanic. It's going to be comfortable, which is usually a poor leg swing and arms flailing, whatever it is. So you do need to train to run properly. So I do hear that from parents a lot too. So you just got to figure out what the, what the goals are. You know, most parents, believe it or not, from what I've seen, most parents, they, 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 they know their kids. They do. Yeah, they do. They're realistic too? Yeah, I would say so, yes. Talk about being a true expert in your field you know one thing we always like go back and forth on is again being that expert having pride in what you say keeping your word right setting realistic goals and expectations talk about how that stands out in your industry unlike any other being a true expert and knowing what works versus what doesn't work well i think the beauty of again being in a facility of the magnitude that i'm in you know a lot of experts in their different fields do come to to the facility and impart their wisdom. So I always like to say this. Um, you know, I might have a uh, black belt around my waist, but I got a white belt around my mind. Interesting. Because my mind is always open and always trying to learn. I think everybody on, our, on, on the staff is the same way. You know, if we have Dan Path in or Michelle DeCourt in, whoever the other, say, you know, subject matter expert is, we relish it so we can learn something. So we're fortunate because, again, of, of, of who we are. You know, we're again, we're one of the elite, you know, training centers in the country. Maybe even, maybe even in the world, if I could, if I could be so bold. I've had people come here from Australia, from you know Germany, just uh, from Scotland, from Denmark, just to visit. Because yeah, I saw your videos, or yeah, we used to get the we used to get the DVDs. There was such a thing as DVDs. So people know the facility. So with that, it allows us to bring in experts who we can learn from. Nobody in, my, nobody in the facility is saying, oh, I don't, I don't want to go see, uh, you know, or Dan Path's coming. Oh, I don't want to see Dan Path. I'm not, sure. my, wow, wait, Dan, when's Dan Path coming? I want to look and go learn something. Do you find that because you're an expert, you only want to deal with experts in every part of your life? Well, that's a very, very good question. Uh, first of all, I don't know what kind of expert I might be, but what I, but what, what I like to do is I consider, again, because I've got this white belt, you know, really, really cinched up here, I'm out on this quest for knowledge. So if it's, boy, I'm getting a mortgage for my daughter, I'm gonna go try to find the person who I use a subject matter expert, who's a trusted subject matter expert. So whatever the field it is, if it's if I need a landscaper, or if I need a mortgage person, or whatever I'm looking to get or do, I'm gonna go out and seek out a trusted subject matter expert. Now the now, one thing I'll, I'll say is being in like UPS and being in business and being you know, in my later 50s, I'm, I'm pretty good at you know, finding experts. 
A lot of people, yeah, yeah, a lot of people will, will masquerade themselves as an expert because they have a lot of followers on Instagram. Sure. sure. But once you meet them face to face, you kind of, ooh, this person, there's some red, there's some, there's some, there's some red flags going up here. I know you're big into being fit and over 50, right? You want to kind of set or raise that bar as you progress in life. And you said today earlier during our workout, you know, you want to live 40 years or 50 years or 60 years. You said 40, but I'll keep going because I think you're going to hit it. Of every day is going to be the best day of your life. You're healthy. You know, you basically have created the life you've wanted, right? And you also said, you know, when you go to nursing homes, you really don't see any fat people, right? Why is that? Why don't we see older, heavier people? What what causes that? Let's touch on that a little bit. Yeah, you know, that's almost another podcast. For, it could be a whole podcast into itself because I don't know if people think they're going to live forever. But again, like you want to shorten your life, you know, you know be, be overweight, out, be overweight, be out of shape. I mean, those are the things like. I will never ever downplay the effects of COVID, but what COVID did was it picked off a lot of people who were just basically, you know, they're overweight, um, hypertension, um, uh, diabetes, smokers, smokers, right? you name it. Those people again, they really didn't pick off the healthy people. So this is again, there's, this was COVID nineteen. It'll be a COVID twenty nine. Mark my words on that. Why people leave themselves um, in that position, that I can't answer. The most important thing eventually is, is is basically how long you could live for and how and, and basically how healthy you can be. And the greatest joy I have right now is this amazing relationship. I've been married 31 years. I have an amazing relationship with my wife. I have an amazing relationship with my adult children. This is the payoff. This is the payoff for the you know the 27 years at UPS, working, you know, 12, 13, whatever the hours were, the peak seasons. And anybody on this who's watching this who's at UPS, they know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you, you sometimes you just do things you don't even imagine what you're sure. doing there. But you work you work all this to get to 55 at UPS, for instance, or whatever the age might be where you could basically stop working and, and really what? Enjoy your life. And without health, how do you enjoy your life? That I don't understand. Like why people discount probably the most important thing. You know, I'll talk why about is that? I wish I knew. They'll talk about their 401k. They'll talk about, you know, I, I'm getting benefits for life or, wow, I got a second property. I just got a new car. No one's talking about, hey, you know what? I just benched my body weight for 10. Or, hey, you know what? I'm trying to just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm cutting out uh, all dairy from my diet. I feel much better, less inflammation in my body. You know what? I just went for my yearly checkup and my blood pressure is down X amount of points. My cholesterol is down to this. My, you know, this, all these indices are, are pointing in the right direction. I'm not pre-diabetic. Do you think people take their health for granted? Oh, of course they do. Of course they do. If they didn't, if you look at the leading killers, even after COVID, COVID will still be third behind like hypertension and cancer. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, of course. So, so, so in, uh, in 2022, it's usually going to be something that's self-inflicted for the most part. Hypertension. Diabetes, obesity, these are all killers. They're all self Do you know 90% of diabetics in this country are adult onset? Only 10% of people are born with diabetes. Crazy. Yeah. And if I said to you, all you need to do is maybe exercise, you know, three to four times a week, again, I'm not telling you you got to be like me. Yeah, you're, I, you're the top. I, of the I would top, never, because right? again, I'm uh, the only non-vegan thing I eat. Is, I have cottage cheese every morning. I love. I just Which walk. For anyone that's not had cottage cheese, he put me onto it last year, and I like drool for it. <laughs> <laughs> I love cottage cheese, and uh, besides that, I live. You know, my I uh, uh, vegan lifestyle. You know, I train vigorously. You know, five to six days a week. I'm not telling anybody to do that. You can if you want. Don't get me wrong. But how about we try to exercise three to four times a week? I would try to maintain, you know, cut out one bad thing. Don't have the hog and dogs before you go to bed. Let's just throw that out there, sure. you know. Like, and, and if I told you did all those things and you can extend your life by three, five, 10, 15 years, would you do it? And you would think the answer would be yes, right? Well, well, the health professionals, the health experts, all the data says it does. Even if they just dismiss it. I don't get it. But yet we'll throw we'll throw a mask on a ninety five degree day and we'll walk in the middle of Manhattan and feel safe. I don't understand it. So do you feel like because you're a very measurable person, like you say, okay, this is very objective, right? 
that that is how you're able to maintain your overall consistency? My wife said to me the other day, she goes to me. Was it a compliment? I think so. <laughs> you tell me. Yeah. You're the only person I know who's making it a competition to live as long as you can. <laughs> true. Well, and, true. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm good with that. Did you chuckle? Or was I, I laughed a little bit. And then she went on her way? Yeah, she went on her way. Because, I, I, again, it's not just living long. It's like what I said before is it's the healthy living long. Like I see my mom. I've, uh, I see my mom at least once a week now. She's uh, coming up on 90. Man, if you saw my if, you, if my mother was walking away from us right now and you saw her and I said, how old do you think that woman is? You're not saying 90. And, how, and then how? Healthy lifestyle, exercises. Extra gardening. Yeah, and yeah, we killed her yesterday. <laughs> but uh, again, very, very, you know, lasered in on, Wow, I'm gonna I'm gonna be as healthy as possible. Again, she's not as extreme as I am. Don't get me wrong, but again, she she exercises regularly and she watches what she eats. She maintains a proper body weight, and she's 90. You know, she basically outlived all her peers. She was born 1930, you know, 1932, and she's not just 89 actually, nine and a half. I hope she's not listening to this. She hates when I say that. But it, it, again, she, she have YouTube. <laughs> she, she had a channel since 2004, <laughs> <laughs> but um. I, again, I don't know why people discount that. It's not like there's not a gym in every town. Is it because it's hard? Or what do you think, realistically? If you had to put the number one reason why people avoid that, which again, look, you do all things in the world. If you're not living, all the other shit you do is kind of irrelevant, right? Well, you know, it's a, it's, nobody's ever asked me that. Ever? No. Like why people don't do it. There has to be, there's probably multiple reasons, but like the number uh, as, one reason. Because you know what it is? It's not, the, it's not the death scare, because it can't be, because... I really thought, like now we're open up to full capacity at the, sure. the adult side of the, uh, of the business. There'll be a line out the door. Uh, people are going to try to avoid this next. Sure. Again, sure. every 10 years ago, it was a swine flu. Then every 10 years, another. New flu. Yeah, some, some thing, something comes along that's going to be like devastating to the population of the people who are, who are compromised. And we know this didn't pick off the, the healthy people. This basically picked off the, 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 first, the first batch that went were the compromised people. And weak. Everything's weak. So you would think, weak. I would think that, man, you know what? I'm about 20 pounds overweight. In 10 years, I might be 40 pounds overweight. I'll be a little bit older. I survive this. I'm not going to be one of those people who's going to be just waiting around for something to show up. Obviously, getting back into anything is always challenging, right? So I would use the example of, like, let's say, well, I broke my ankle. I took a couple months off. I worked out on my own, and I knew I had to get back in and train with you, right? Obviously, the first couple sessions or week or month are going to be challenging, right? Because it's something new. It's something that's painful. It's something that's hard. It's early. Like everything's stacked against you. Other than walking out of there, you feel very accomplished after the sweat, after everything, right? I always say, okay, I'm 30 pounds overweight, right? I let myself fall for five years, whatever the case might be. I'm not me. You're a lot of people, right? And they come in one day and they're like, oh, I put a pound on. And they never come back. How much time would you say, realistically, on average, would it take to get that person reacclimated on their routine, consistent, and then have an easier time showing up and seeing results? I think people in today's world want results yesterday, but they won't put the work in. So in your level of profession, based on your experience, what is that time? Is it a week? Is it two weeks? Is it 10 weeks? Very good question. Now, the first thing that has to happen is there has to be um, expectations have to be set. By you or by the client? The client. You're not going to come in here and train seven days a week. Right. It's not happening. You might for a week, and then guess what? I'll never see you again because I'll hate this. It has to be something you enjoy. Okay, so Jeff, 30 pounds overweight. Okay, we want to get this 30 pounds over. It's going to be a process. How many days a week? Can you, oh, sorry, no. How many days can you commit to coming in? What, twice a week? Once won't do it. I, I need at least a minimum of twice a week. Preferably three. So two out of seven days, you should be in the gym. Right. In this. I, I preferably like to get three. Okay. But again, what I want to do is I don't want to make this a job. I started getting into some running, some uh, mid-distance running. You know, my daughter, okay. Samantha, likes to, you know, during the, you know, my daughter, Samantha, likes to train outside. You know, great experience for us. We, we, we mountain bike ride. We, uh, we run. So I kind of got into this um, mid-distance running. And what I like about it is the plan I'm on is three days a week. If it was four or five, I probably would have stopped by now. That's me. Just too much? Too much. Three days a week, I can commit to that and go three days hard. 
So I'm going to go in. It's enjoyable. I think about the workouts. It's three days a week. It's, let's say it's four hours a week. Out of 168 hours in a week, I can commit to that. It's not a job. It's enjoyable. Okay, we go, we go a few weeks on this. Two, three, four. Boy, I'm really, hey, you know what? I was talking to Jeff at, at the gym the other day. He says there's a Saturday boot camp that's really cool. Let's try that out. Yeah, maybe every other Saturday you come in. It's cool. It's upper body only. It's an hour and 15 minutes. It's a group of 20 people, like-minded people. You're all professionals. You can talk afterwards. Networking, before. a little business. Yeah, thing. yeah. Okay, so now I'm coming in three days this week, four next, three, four, three, four. Then maybe, wow, you know what? Those Saturdays are really, really good. I really enjoy those. Now I start coming in four days a week because I really, I really like being here. This has become like a big part of you know what, with mom. Yeah, you know what I'm finding too is I'm eating better. Hey, you know what? I'm sleeping better. Hey, you know what? I was, I was at a barbecue over the weekend. Somebody said, "Hey, you look. Did you lose ten pounds? You look pretty good." The mistake people make. You said it in the beginning of this. They want it all today, or yeah, they want it all yesterday. yesterday. I do nothing. Right. And now they're willing to do something, but for a week, they they almost like they go, they go all in. They put all their chips in the center. They, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna bluff here. I got gotcha. nothing. Gotcha. You can't bluff this. So you think they just go all out, exhaust themselves, and they fall off? It's not. I think I That's know. That's what it is. That's why if you go to if you go like uh, if you go to Amazon Books right now, yeah. how many uh, fat diet books are there? Right. Yeah. Lose yeah. twenty pounds in a day. You know, cleanses Number this and seller. that. Yeah. All you got to do is burn more calories than you take in. <laughs> that's, as simple that, as it is. That's, that's, that's weight reduction. Well, that's kind of, and I think we have such a valuable relationship professionally and personally at this point, right? I think there's a mutual admiration for each other and we learn from each other daily. And I think, I want to say I'm an experiment, but with myself, I at least am an experiment where the harder I want to work in general, the harder I want to work for myself, the harder I want to work for you and us for what we're building. Because like, look, my results are your results, right? We're kind of married in that sense when we're training at the gym. Like, you're my trainer, right? Like, I don't want to be a poor reflection on you. So as we started kicking up last summer, like, the level of intensity, I realized, shit, I can't go to bed at 11 o'clock So I'm waking up at 5.20. I got to go to bed at 9 o'clock, right? So my sleep, I now started adding two-hour buffer there. And it was like, man, my strength's not really getting anywhere. Now I got on a meal plan. I need to eat better. Like, what are you doing, right? So it went from... Okay, I've exhausted all my natural ability options. Now where can I pick up an extra rep, right? Or an extra tenth, whatever, to improve. So like the evolution went from, yeah, this just started out me wanting to get in like decent shape to how far can I push this and where can I get those secrets coming in? Like that's where I think we've had the biggest catalyst of a yeah, a fruitful, prosperous relationship for both of us because it's like it's never ending, right? You can always improve and there's so many little tricks that you know, that I know, that complement each other, that just, it's like, it's, it's exciting. Like, how much more are we gonna un unravel? How many more, you know, ounces of gold are we gonna mine when we're together? It's kind of how I feel. Going to the beginning part of that statement, one thing about a person like myself and working with uh, any client, if it's a high schooler, college, professional, or I refer to a person like yourself as general population. So I hope you don't take that in the wrong way. This is what it is, general pop. With me, I'm so vested in your results, but I can't be more invested than you are. So as long as we're both putting the same amount of chips into the center of the table, using a poker expression, we're, we're, we're okay. Sometimes what happens with me and some of the people I end up training with, boy, I'm all in. Like, I can't tell you how many times people have asked me, I'm not a dietitian, so, but can you tell me what you eat? I tell them what I eat, the, the four meals I have every day. I eat the same thing every, it's crazy. I know people listening to this, it's crazy. I eat the same thing every single day. I, I, I like it, so again, so it's a game. You wanna walk everybody through your diet real quick, just so they understand? Uh, or no? I, 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 if it's Guys, cheese, protein shake, oatmeal, fruits, yeah, so it's, nuts, Well, it's salad. basically It's basically four meals, it's up. First thing is the, is the cottage cheese meal. That's the first one. Second one, uh, second meal is the oatmeal based meal. The third one is the protein shake based meal, and the nighttime meal is the uh, bean based meal. My wife Nancy has become an amazing 
She's just so creative when it comes to making these bean dishes. She runs that department. Oh my gosh, she's a lentil, lentil soups, and she's just. The only thing about the beans is she makes enough where, <laughs> you know, it's basically a four day in a row, and I'll put an avocado in it, some yeah. brown rice in it. That's my four, my four basic meals. Yep. And somebody will ask me, I'll, I'll put it on the spreadsheet for him. I'll give it to him. I'll show him what all the breakdown everything is. How's it going? Ah, I kind of got oh, a lot. I left it, it, I left it in the locker yeah, room. Yeah, yeah. I forgot to get the cottage cheese this morning. I haven't had cottage cheese in a month. But I think one of the biggest takeaways early on I had from you, again, as, as a client, right, and also as a friend, we've gotten to that level, is you can't go from your current lifestyle to a brand new lifestyle overnight. So you say to me, listen, just start eating cottage cheese every morning. Just start with that. Once you've mastered that for two weeks, then you add the second meal, right? Then once you master that for two weeks, then you add the third meal. You're not going to go from eating Dunkin' Donuts, Taco Bell, McDonald's, Burger King to this lifestyle, right? You have to ease into it. You can't just turn off the switch. I mean, isn't that kind of like the number one advice you can give? You're not going to do it's, that. It's like I always tell people, if I tasked you with eat this elephant, and you're like, wow, that's, that's, a, lot of, that's a lot of meat. It's an elephant. Right. And I always say, well, you know, Take very, very small bites. Lifestyle is no different. Now, for a person like myself, who's incredibly compulsive and all or nothing, I I need to just turn the switch off. But that's me. Right. And there's You're this, able to do that. You're also strong willed mentally. Right. For the for the majority of people, they're not, you know, they are not gonna go and again, I wouldn't recommend just turning everything off because I think you crash. Like I haven't had alcohol in uh, over thirty three years. I haven't had a drink. Zero. I mean nothing. I found it to be the easiest way to l- live my life. So no alcohol, zero. I don't want to have one. I, I, to me, it's I don't drink. <laughs> it's that simple. And to me, I, I, I compartmentize it here and in my mind. It makes things so much easier for me. No. The answer is no. No. The answer is no. Absolutely not. How, how, um, how about some birthday cake? No. No. <laughs> I just, just you know, hey, so, you know, no, no. The answer is no. Put it on your tongue. No. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'll never tell you not to have the birthday cake. You don't tell me to have the birthday cake. But it, that's me. And I'll say this, as far as like the lifestyle goes, uh, it's crucial if you are really serious about this. And we could talk about this forever, I think, is, is creating this, like your, your circle around you, of people who support you. Like my wife, very, very supportive. I, we, I, have, um, I see my in-laws quite often, very, very supportive. My mom, very supportive, as far as the food goes. Sure. Not, yeah, they it also have, took some time for you to get them there, right? Uh, again, very strong-willed. So I'm not going to have the pasta. You know, if you want me to, you know, to, to partake in this, the food, <laughs> this is what I need to eat. <laughs> At first, probably, this guy's crazy, but... <laughs> we'll break him, we'll break him, nah, we'll break him. You're right. But, uh, <laughs> but, yeah, you need to have the support because you can't always have people telling you you're crazy and, no, you're not going to have that as opposed to... Okay, Rich. We have your um, we have your bean dish here. I got your broccoli. We got the you know we got some um, you know um, the potatoes are over here. Your it nuts. probably warms your heart though, right? The fact that they support of course, you. Like that. Of course, again, I think it's you know, again another podcast for another day is how important your family is in all this. Sure. You know, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm getting choked up now, because again, you want to live this long, healthy life so you can enjoy your family. Yeah, I said it before. Just my relationship with my adult children. Unheard of. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because you don't imagine that. When your kids are, you know, when they're born up until, say, they go to college, you're not thinking about, wow, this is going to be amazing when they become adults. We'll be able to do, we'll be able to go mountain bike riding, run 5Ks, go, go to by DC their houses. The yeah, yeah, go to D, you know, go see them in their, 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 how they're functioning in their, in their own world. And let them, you know, my one girl lives in uh, Washington, D.C. You don't imagine that. And I think it's all part of it, to be healthy, to be healthy with them, enjoy that lifestyle. It's a great, great, great way to basically go into your ladder, your golden years. To me, the golden years are... (sighs) Which most people have. uh, 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 Ian, where's my cane? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ian, you got his cane or no? You know, where's the word? You know, again, and I don't want to sound like I'm this, you know, this prophet or anything, but uh, again, I am... But I think you're a big guy that controls what he can control. And that's the biggest thing, I think, why you've gotten to the levels which you've gotten at and you've hit these levels. So forget the mentality portion of it is, it's like, look, I need to put myself in a situation where I can control the outcome. And I'll relate that to 
our workout on Saturday. You know, it was one of those, you know, again, normally we're two weeks guaranteed every week. Every other Saturday, we usually get a workout in, right? And it's like, I woke up Saturday morning. I was like, did I over, I thought to myself, you know, again, I have to go down the shore. It's my godson's birthday, you know, like I'm going to be late, whatever. Did I overcommit coming off of a high when we were working out prior this week? Yeah, it's during the week. We're in our routine. Yeah, I'm coming off a workout. Of course, I'll come in Saturday. I need this. And then you wake up Saturday morning. And it's like, did I overcommit? And then when, when I got there, it was a whole different element. As I was getting there, I was getting excited. I was getting amped up. And then you put one more set on the bench, which we have we really haven't done since last year, realistically, weight-wise. And I thought you were going to say one rep. And you were like, all right, go for three. And... I remember I walked away from the bench, I paced myself, and at that moment I had this like big aha moment of, at the end of the day, your whole life you've been pissed off that you haven't been in control. What coach didn't put you in? What manager didn't promote you? Who didn't give you that deal, right? All these variables that you've been hanging your hat on and you've been pissed off about still a decade or so later, right? In this moment, the only person that's responsible of this outcome is myself. And we hit the three. Easy, relatively easy, you know? And it was like, holy crap, I need to put myself in more positions like this where only I can control what happens from here on out. I feel like that's how you kind of live your life. I think you, you, you really hit on something very, very strong. And it has to be, you can't wake up one day when you're 60 and say, oh, I'm going to start controlling my life. It, it, it might be, I'm not saying it is, it might be too late. You think at 60? I, I could be 55. Whatever, yeah, 50, it, yeah, right. And I think, because uh, I was reading a stat not that long ago, they said for uh, the most vulnerable time in a person's life is like 54. Empty house. So a lot of things going. Uh, Retirement's in reach. A lot of things have gone wrong. A lot of things have gone wrong. So that, 50s are very like that make or break A lot decade. of a high, high rate of suicide. In the 50s. In the 50s for all these things that have gone wrong. What do you attribute that to? But the list is long. The list is long. Scary. It's actually scary. It is, but it's that, that's the, 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 the data says that. That brings you to a whole nother. You know what's interesting, right? And obviously, you know, I'm still toying around with this whole new fatherhood thing. You know, my son will be three this September, and I know how much I think of my son, right? It's like, I feel like the next wave of employment is coming from parents re entering the workforce, right? I think coming out of COVID, people realize the value of daycare and schooling and like, oh, I didn't do this, I didn't do that. I think the 50 and up, like if, if I had to bet on somebody right now, while well, you just said that, I think that's where we need to focus, you and I, on like that 50 to 65 window and help them. Because they, they need the resources. Like they're, put most of their life's behind them at this point, unfortunately, right? Unless they're gonna live to 100 or Well, that's one, of the reasons, that's one of the reasons why they come to that reality. Right, they lost pretty much 50% of their life, if not more than that percentage-wise. But like, there's also an opportunity there for people like us to help them extend their life, improve their quality of life, get them re-motivated. Oh, I think that has to happen before they get to 50. You think so? No, I know so. Well, I just think that your average person's having kids like 25 to 30. Yeah, maybe it's got, maybe, you know, maybe. Push back a little bit. Yeah, push back a little bit now because, like, you know, we had our children uh, late 20s to right, 30. Right, think about now. If you're 32, you have a kid. Most 18, people aren't getting married. 50, right. you know, so now you're 50 years so old and lot, your house is Right, empty. a lot of times with the, with the people in their 50s, unfortunately, they've gotten themselves into a lot of bad situations. You know, again, you know, this opiate, sure. uh, opiate Sad. crisis. That we've gone through recently. That's not. I mean, that's not for teenagers. It's really for people kind of like who are banged up, giving up. Yeah. Body hurts, mind hurts, you know. no money, financially hurt. Chances are, might be divorced. Adult children don't. Multiple hurt. times, maybe. Adult children might hate them. Oh, they, they, after life is gone, haven't accomplished anything. So you think that's where the reality check comes in at that? I, I, again, I'm just looking at the data and like some of the reasons why. Like I said, I think that the actual number was 54. It's the most vulnerable spot. I'm, I'm, I'm you passed that already. You're good. I made it, yeah. yeah I made it. So I know, obviously, being a part of your gym on both sides, a member of both sides, you're big on group classes, right? Walk people that are listening through that live in, like, the Bergen, Hudson, Essex County area, maybe a little bit Passaic. What are your group classes all about? Yes, this is a workout. Yes, it's like a boot camp. It's obviously not CrossFit, which I know you hate CrossFit and don't believe in CrossFit. What are your group classes like, and who's your ideal target demographic for your boot camp classes? First of all, I don't hate CrossFit. I just think CrossFit's for a very, very small percentage of the population. Because, again, CrossFit's basically you know, gymnastics, um, 
uh, Olympic lifting based. So it's a, it's a high, it's a sport. It's a sport. It's not really a workout. It's a really, really a high functional type of activity. So of course, it's not for everybody, like they say. Right. It's definitely not the, the true CrossFit because right. it's got a really um, basis in Olympic, Olympic and Olympic lifting and gymnastics. The fad CrossFit, yeah. Well, I'm just yeah. saying it's. I don't hate it. I just said it's, it's again. It's not for most. Gotcha. Like people think they're gonna go clean and jerk and snatch and you know do like handstand push-ups and walk on their hands type of thing. You know, that's a CrossFit. You know, again, it's it's a really, really it's, it's a challenging it's a challenging uh, workout for sure. So I, I don't hate it. I just said it's not for general. I think, I don't think me personally, I don't think it's really for general population. Plus, it's not healthy for you. I wouldn't say that either. Again, if you're really good at gymnastics and Olympic lifting, it's, it's very healthy for gotcha. you. But again, I'm not gonna you know it's not for your, your lay person. Gotcha. Like to be again, that's to be con- again. Like, you could change anything, and it's not CrossFit. Okay, we're not going to do the Olympic lifts. We're not going to do the gymnastics. That's not like CrossFit, then. Right, right. The true CrossFit, we're, we're talking about. Obviously. Uh, uh, so, uh, so the boot camp class, you know, uh, it's really hard to explain because we, we cover a lot of ground. I mean, we have one that's just upper body, just lower body. So you have different classes. For- we, have, we have a class for everything. Gotcha. And I think the beauty of it is because of the facility, even though like, it's split in two, the morning, the morning part of the day, since the, the performance side really isn't being used, we do run some of the classes on the performance side. So we have access to the track. We have access to the turf. So really, these classes that we run, these boot camp classes or these group activities, take place on the turf, on the track, in the octagon room, in the three-pod room, in the group X room. It's using all the resources. We have, I, yeah, I'll match up our variety. That's Again, that's why... Some of the things that I struggle with in the fitness uh, world with the adult side, the general population side is, boy, I don't know how some of these other you know, companies do it. There's no variety. It's like, you know. Same thing. Yeah, I'm not going to bring out what, what companies they sure. are because it's not really fair sure. to them. But, you know, that's one thing that we're always looking for is variety. Okay, today we're going to do a track workout. Today we're going to be, be on the turf. Today we'll be in the group X room, octagon room, three we're in all these different places. It's doing like a mystery workout. Yeah, doing these, I would say mystery, but doing these, doing these different modalities, not only to challenge you physically, but to challenge you mentally. And again, we're not doing anything that a lay person couldn't do. So you're not, you're not compromising a workout for someone's health, for example. Exactly. We're not doing anything that's you know highly, highly specific. Now, what's your price point for somebody that would want to join this specific group training? What do you charge? Is it monthly? Is it annually? Yes, yeah, so we have we have a class. Yeah, so like again, the best thing is to go to the website. What's the website? Escape Fitness Now. EscapeFitnessNow.com. Yeah, it's in Furlong, New Jersey. We're twelve miles outside of Manhattan, so we're in Bergen County. Uh, the best thing is to check out the website because the, you know, the pricing is is different for whatever you want to get yourself into. You have a, you know, you have a. It's kind of like a tiered pricing. That the more you pay, the more you get. So you can have access to all the classes. Uh, the more you pay, you get some uh, group training. Some you know. So some of the so some of the really good value is you 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 pay a you pay a monthly fee and you get the group classes and then you can get like four small group trainings which are good with the barbells and stuff and get again our coaches most of my coaches and not all of them are exercise scientists and you also have I believe some type of virtual we have a virtual well, vir- right? yeah virtual option so virtual option we also have that. What's your belief in the virtual option? Obviously, I like the one-on-one. I mean, who is so who is your virtual option I, it's, for? It's it's not is uh, is it for the person that can't make it that yeah, day? Yeah, it's not a huge. Uh, we have it, and I'll I'll say I spent a lot of money on it. Yeah, I got like a you know I don't have Ian coming by me, but I have. We can um, bring them. Yeah, I have a high tech setup, like a professional camera sure. situation, a whole bit. And the people say who are home doing it, it's like being there. It's not a big seller. I. Is it because of a price point? Is it because no, it's hard? I think it's just it's. It, I personally feel it's tough training at home. Too much your, else going on. Your house is your comfort place. You know they always say go heavier, go home. Yeah. I never understood that because I like I like my house. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll go home. <laughs> Love it there. Nice comfortable chair, TV, refrigerator, sauna, it's, bath. Yeah, yeah, I got a beautiful. I love my house. So I think that's what happens when you really got to get after it. I think it's hard. In my, it's my opinion. I get you. Psychologically, wow, really getting after it in my living room. Gotcha. You know, two minutes ago I was watching Eating popcorn. Uh, yeah, two minutes ago I was watching the uh, you know Disney, Disney <laughs> Channel. You know, now I'm jumping gotta, up and down. Yeah, I gotta get after it. So let's debunk the myth real quick. You say this all the time. Your average person thinks, oh, I got a great workout. I just buried myself. My trainer just buried me. I can't move. 
debunk that myth for everybody watching. Like, just because somebody buried you, you can't walk the next day. Change your, like, change everyone's misconception of that. You always say to me, like, it doesn't I don't have to bury you. Yeah, bury, I want you to perform. Right, burying somebody again, using that term. Like, you you know, use that term, right? Isn't uh, term? Yeah, anybody can. You know, I, I can I can I can get anybody to throw up. Anybody. Yeah, anybody. You run them into the ground. Yeah, run them into the ground. So let's, okay, we're gonna we're, we're gonna do uh, like, uh, suicides for five minutes, burpees for ten minutes. Now, no, you want to you want to basically the key to a good session is challenging yourself both mentally and physically, burning a certain amount of calories and being able to finish the workout and just you know getting yourself oh getting close to that red zone oh come back down oh come back down you want to push it right to the edge of the cliff and bring it back that's the good workout and then you want to be able to say wow that was so enjoyable i want to come back as opposed to yeah i'm laying here in my own puddle of sweat <laughs> kick it up or you know i vomited you don't want that that's not enjoyable. You know what? It has to. Be, there has to be something to say. I want to come back. It's not a general popular. Yeah, I think even even perform, performance training even more so. No, less is more in the performance. You have to side. want to come back. Uh, less is more. You know, you, you definitely just it's you, you you really want to. I can't wait to get back there and do that one again. You know, what I think so exciting about working with you in particular, and it's like anything. Like, look, if we didn't click. I probably wouldn't have as much good workouts, right? I mean, that's just, it is what it is. If you don't like the person you're working with and you don't want to work for the person you're being, you know, side by side with, it's irrelevant. I think the thing I appreciate about you most, one of the things, and there's probably 10 that are all tied for number one, is if I tell you want to get somewhere, you have the path to get me there. And we'll use just like benching 20 reps at 20 reps, right? You say, okay, here's your path. We want to get 12 on the first breath. We want to get three on the second breath, right? Now we're at 15. Now we have five left. Is it five singles or is it two and then one, one, one? You give me the path and you're not afraid of deviating from that path based on what you see with me. So it might be 12 on the first three and then five ones, like I said. I think giving somebody the path to where they want to be is probably the most valuable thing because you're basically saying, look, if you follow these steps based on my track record, based on my level of expertise, you're going to get here. But I think the problem is most people don't respect the person giving them the information. The person is either giving them the wrong information or they give up halfway through the path coming to the end. So what allows you in particular to maintain your clientele and stay true to the path of what works? I think most people that deal with me consider me a trusted expert. Now, is it because I'm more mature? Seasoned. Okay, well, you're seasoned. I hate using the word old. So most people look at me as a trusted expert, especially in this field. You know, most, you know, most coaches or trainers are not as seasoned as I am. So... I think most people view me as a trusted expert. So okay, now if I trust a person, I don't care what I'm doing. If I trust that person, I'm going to listen to them. Then as we start developing a relationship, the person can see that, wow, this person really, really cares about me. It's never, wow, Rich knows a lot. It's always, Rich cares about me a lot. And then... Once they see that, how much I care about them, I can show them how much I know. But really, to me, the biggest thing is I really care about that person's result. So if you ask me a question about something I don't know, for instance, that pertains to the, what we're working on, you know what, Jeff, I really don't know that, but you know what, I'll find out. And usually by the time Jeff gets back to his house or gets back to his phone, there's some type of text or email, hey, this is what we were talking about. This is what I found, I found out about it. So... I care a lot about the person. The most important thing to me is the person in front of me at that moment. So present. And that's why I never understood, like, you know, like why people are so married to their phones when they're actually engaging with a person. Have you ever seen me, again, on the phone with me and you? And, I, and again, I'm not saying I'm any busier than anybody else, but I do have, a, I have quite a few balls in the air. And I'm with Jeff Van Note. I'm with Jeff Van No. I'm not with my and phone. And vice versa. I mean, I think that's the biggest thing. It's like when I go to your facility, my home away from home, and I'm not training with you, I'm just going in there and whatever. 
going there to go there because I enjoy being in that environment and presence, whether I'm you know stepping on one of your machines or I'm just getting a workout on my own for whatever reason last minute. I have my phone on me. But like the level of productivity we have in five minutes together is better than an hour of me being there on my own because this one's going off, text going off, email sidetrack, wrong song comes on. You know, when we're together, it's like we're constantly feeding off each other because at that moment, there's three things that exist. Me, you, and the workout we're doing. And I think from a, from a mentality standpoint, it allows me to be so present. I'm fully invested and there's no distracting thoughts because we know that we have every so many minutes a new goal or a new objective coming up that we need to match and meet. It's the greatest gift you can give to yourself is living in the present. That's why it's called the present. So as we close up every episode, we leave the listeners with one powerful piece to deposit that to their brain. What's one thing you want everybody listening to this episode to walk away from to deposit to their daily arsenal? You ultimately control the last chapter of your life. Don't wait until you get there. Start writing the chapters before that. And this way you could write the ending you want. So happy early birthday. I know oh, 58 you. next week, right? 58? 57. 57 I'm next week. I'm oh, actually. all right. 57 next week. Um, I appreciate everything that we've been through together so far. Now 13 months of friendship. Um, we've come a long way in three years. When three years ago I said, I'm going to run a 4740. And you're like, you're going to run a 50840. And I ran a 580840. So I appreciate everything about you. I hope, you know, I can do everything possible to help you grow your business. And I look forward to what's in the future for us. I think we have a lot of good to do. Likewise. And I think, you know, no matter what business you're in, it's really developing joint relationships. You know, the Portuguese have an expression that says, if you hang around with that, you end up sleeping upside down. And to be successful, I think, in any business, surround yourself with subject matter experts who you absolutely trust. Don't hang out with bats and don't sleep upside down. Believe on that <laughs> note. <laughs>